welcome to the IoT for All podcast. I'm Ryan Chacon, and on this episode, you're going to get some really great insights into the biggest firmware vulnerabilities and how to fix them. And I'll be spending time talking with Thomas Pace, the co-founder and CEO of NetRise, a leading firmware security company that provides visibility and risk identification to a class of devices. Um, ton of value here in this episode. If you're watching this on YouTube, we truly appreciate it if you would like, subscribe, and hit that bell icon so you get the latest episodes as soon as they are out. Other than that, let's get on to the episode. Welcome, Tom, to the IT for All podcast. Thanks for being here this week. Happy to be here, man. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, let me kick this off by having you give a quick introduction about yourself to our audience, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. So I'm Tom Pace, co-founder and CEO of NetRise. NetRise is a company that is <clears throat> providing visibility and risk identification to a class of devices known as XIoT, Extended Internet of Things, uh, which includes IoT, ICS, medical devices, embedded systems and vehicles, satellites and telecommunications equipment. And we provide that visibility and risk identification by doing scalable automated firmware analysis. Fantastic. One thing I want, I want to ask you real quick. Um, so when it comes to firmware analysis, how, how has that kind of just historically been done? You know, what's, why is it a focus for you all and kind of what's the value when you're talking about doing that at scale? Yeah. So I started my career, uh, or rather I, you know, Prior to this, uh, I was working at Department of Energy, um, 2013, 2016, okay. uh, doing industrial control system security. And one of the things uh, I was tasked with is determining the impact of various vulnerabilities and risks against our ICS devices. And, you know, we had a few of those. Um, and what was quickly determined is we basically had no technical capability to be able to answer those kinds of questions mm. in any kind of meaningful way, either at scale or not at scale. Right. So the real, the only real way that this problem has been approached historically has been by doing like manual consulting engagements, essentially, where, you know, if you're a device manufacturer, you, uh, you know, interact with some consulting firm who rips apart the firmware, does as good of a job as they can at identifying some components, finding vulnerabilities, et cetera. Um, problem is that's a very snapshot in time kind of assessment. Um, and then that's wildly unscalable for, for a number of various obvious reasons. And then the only other way is relying on the device manufacturers themselves to publish all of the issues that are known in their devices, which obviously is never going to happen. Right, right. And you mentioned XIoT. That's actually kind of a newish term from a lot of conversations that I've had. When yep. it comes to the firmware side of things, how does that how does the approach differ when it comes to XIoT and then, you know, other IoT devices that you've uh, kind of experienced or other people out there maybe using themselves? Yeah, so XIoT devices are typically running like an embedded operating system. Okay. Uh, so, you know, a, a ton of these devices are just running like embedded Linux. So it has a file system, it has, you know, user directories, it has applications and configuration files and normal things you would expect to see um, in, in just a Linux operating system. Um, uh, we really break it down into two or three different categories. You have embedded Linux, and then you have RTOS, real-time operating systems. So things like VxWorks, Green Hills, um, UCOS, ECOS. That is, is, is um, generalizing, but typically like a single binary uh, operating system. Um, mm -hmm. And so much, much harder problem. I mean, we support that as well. And then you have Windows firmware, which is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, right. So the things that are different than that would be things that are just like machine code. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at uh, stuff like uh, BIOS firmware and like UEFI stuff, um, graphics card firmware, network card firmware, there's a wide range of what that can be. Sure. Um, but we, we tend to focus a lot more on like the embedded operating system side of firmware. So okay. if you look at firmware for like laptops, we typically aren't super interested in the firmware that's on those, okay. but we are very interested in firmware that's on like router switches, security cameras, printers, that kind of stuff. And, and what are some of the biggest vulnerabilities when it comes to firmware that, you know, in aud our audience out there listening to this should be thinking about, um, if they're, you know, maybe on more, you know, they might be a little unfamiliar or disconnected from the firmware side, but what should they be thinking about when it comes to those vulnerabilities and how do you kind of approach addressing them, fixing them, making sure that they're not vulnerabilities anymore? 
Yeah, I mean, number one, I think people will be very surprised to see the types of vulnerabilities that exist on these devices mm. are the same kinds of vulnerabilities that exist on on their traditional IT assets. There's no difference. Uh, they're typically a lot older. Um, and so, but other issues we identify that are not, you know, directly known as like vulnerabilities or CVEs, things like weak credentials, misconfigurations, uh, identifying private keys or API keys. So there's a number of other things that we identify that are incredibly risky and problematic aside mm -hmm. from just like traditional CVEs. And so in terms of how you go about addressing those really depends on the persona. So if you are a device manufacturer, obviously you have a number of additional things that you are able to do to remediate or mitigate those vulnerabilities as compared to an enterprise customer who has purchased your device, who right. is not able to update the code at their leisure. Um, technically you could, but then you void the warranty and you cause a bunch of other problems for yourself. So um, if you're a device manufacturer, you can update the components, you can add in other mitigations and things like that. If you're an enterprise user, you can apply pressure back to your device manufacturer. You can apply the latest firmware updates. You can segment those devices in some capacity, uh, apply you know additional monitoring capabilities around those devices, um, leverage a platform like ours for like third party risk management and procurement purposes. Uh, we, okay. We've seen that. So a number of things you can do on both sides. Fantastic. And what what is like, I guess, if, if I if you were to talk somebody through kind of the process you go through when it comes to analyzing the firmware, what does that process look like timeline wise? You know, how does that usually go? What's involved from the, the company that you're working with side versus what you all handle? Like just just kind of at a high level, I'd love to learn more about that. Yeah. Uh, once again, I'll break it into the two different categories. So if we're working with device manufacturers, in a significant number of those scenarios, we can come to the first meeting we have with them with their firmware in the platform already uh, because it's just available on the internet um, or we've gathered from some other location, right? Or we bought a device and ripped the firmware off of it, whatever. So all, it's very easy to get a hold of the firmware by downloading it from publicly available sites or support portals or whatever it is. Um, and so we just upload it into our platform and, you know, depend, there's so many things that depend on processing time, but, uh, for the average size of firmware, you're looking at, let's call it between 15 minutes and an hour, maybe okay. Uh, okay. some stuff takes a very long time. Cause there's like a hundred file systems or something crazy. Sure. But, um, so, but if we come to that without that, the, from a device manufacturer perspective, very easy. They have all of the firmware in some repository or something and getting that set up for them to upload firmware. I mean, literally takes like five minutes. It's, it couldn't be an easier process. Um, for the enterprise customers, there's like an extra step. Uh, and that step is you need to identify the devices you care about and identify the firmware sure. versions of those devices. And once that happens, we can work with them and say like, okay, we already have that firmware, uh, or we need you guys to go download that firmware from the support portal and then upload it to us. So that's mm -hmm. the two basic uh, routes to get firmware to us. I gotcha. mean, they take very, very limited amounts of time. Fantastic. Uh, one thing I kind of slight transition. Um, I know mean, we were talking about this before we jumped on here, but it was uh, talking about software build materials and kind of what that means, what, how that's generated. Um, and, and how you, when you're doing that for firmware, it is kind of tough. Um, I think that's something to shed some light on. I'd love it if you could kind of talk through why generating a software bill materials for firmware is tough, what those challenges are. And then at the end of the day, like obviously it's important to do it. And, and what is the real value there? <clears throat> yeah. So the reason it's challenging is because you have a huge problem at the front end. And that problem at the front end is what is generally known as extraction. And what we mean by that is not extraction of the firmware from the device that always gets confused. What we mean by that is extraction of basically something we can analyze from the firmware image. Now, some firmware images have nothing. There's nothing to extract. It's just like a regular old file system and we're good to go. However, lots of firmware has like proprietary compression algorithms or proprietary file formats, or this file system isn't a file system we've seen before. Um, they might be leveraging encryption 
uh, which I, I use that word. Um, uh, I'm probably giving it a bit more credit than I should. Sometimes <laughs> it's like people just like XOR things and they're like, it's okay. encrypted. And we're like, okay. Um, yeah. So there, there's, there's an infinite number of things that can happen uh, from the extraction process that need to be addressed. So that's the first really big challenge and that's a non-trivial okay. problem. Um, okay. and then once that happens, the ability to identify component, this is all done on zero knowledge analysis, right? Mm -hmm. We are not operating under the assumption that we have, that we are working with a device manufacturer. And even if we were, they don't always know what's what. Right. And so things like, uh, uh, symbols are being stripped from binaries, which makes identifying things more difficult. Uh, uh, backports make things more difficult. Like, Hey, we updated that, um, component actually, but then didn't change the version. And it's like, okay. Um, <laughs> so it's super common though. Happens all the time. So yeah. those things, and then you have just a bunch of proprietary binaries that might not have like a consistent versioning system or any versioning system whatsoever. And so how are you to even identify that in a unique way. So a bunch of problems there that you don't really um, tend to run into. And um, in terms of the value, I mean, tons of value here. Number one, the most important thing is like, do I have this thing? Whatever this thing is, uh, if it's if you're looking, hey, we want to see if we have this component, because we have reason to believe this component was contributed to by a person from this country, and we don't want that to be we don't want that in our device. Uh, or, hey, we know that this component has a critical vulnerability and we wanna know where is that component in our environment? Uh, right. Answering that question right now is totally impossible for enterprise okay. users. It's impossible. They have no way to do it. The only opportunity they have here to get that question answered is by reaching out to every single device manufacturer of every single device they have in their environment. and the overwhelming majority of those device manufacturers will not be able to answer that question for them. Fair enough. Okay, fantastic. Let me, let me ask you another question about um, when it comes to device security and kind of challenges as it connects to that, from your all's perspective of things and the stuff you deal with on a daily basis, where do you kind of see, or, or how do you kind of approach device security? Um, I guess we can start there. Yeah, I mean, we really approach this problem in the same way you approach just about any other um, cybersecurity problem. The first step has to be getting visibility. Um, and the way you get visibility to uh, this problem set is by the best way to do that, in my opinion, right now is generating a software bill of materials. Um, now, there are other things that are important that are not included in a software bill of materials. As I mentioned, like private keys, weak credentials, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not just about an S-bomb. There's no silver bullet as always. Um, so once you have the visibility, now you can do all of these other things, vulnerability correlation, are exploits available? Um, it, should we change this password? Should we delete this username? Should we update this private key? Like whatever it is. Um, but you can't do any of those second order actions until you have very good visibility into what's actually present on these devices from the firmware. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Very cool. Um, last thing I wanted to ask you um, kind of as we wrap up here is around the challenges, other challenges that you see in the space from, you have a very unique perspective that you're bringing coming to this, coming to, you know, IOT devices, X IOT devices from um, you're looking at the, the space from probably a different lens than a lot of the people I've spoken with. I love it just to kind of hear as we're into 2023 now, what are some of the biggest challenges you're seeing companies that you work with kind of struggle with or battle against um, and, um, and kind of just your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, as it relates to this space, <clears throat> I think a big problem that companies are going to have to come to grips with is we are generating a significant amount of net new data that okay. they did not know was there. Uh, so, and we know that and we understand that. And so we've taken, we've taken, um, actions to attempt to soften that as much as we can by doing things like enriching our vulnerability information in a bunch of different ways to allow people to prioritize those in ways that make sense 
outside of just what's available in the NVD, which is nowhere near sufficient to do proper vulnerability prioritization. Um, okay. So that's going to be one of the bigger challenges. Uh, firmware acquisition is always going to have um, some edge cases that that need to be addressed. Um, so those would be those would be the uh, a couple of them. Also combining you know this idea of outside in and inside out. You know outside okay. in companies might be like Armis, Dragos, Clarity, Nizomi, mm. like those kind of people. Um, and then inside out would be someone like us. And so okay. that puts the whole picture together for you. It's like having a network intrusion detection system and EDR, right? Which everybody agrees you should have both at this point, I think. Um, so we're really just applying that same kind of thought process to a class of devices that has basically been ignored forever. Fair enough. Okay. Awesome. Um, one thing, just because this is like an episode we're doing earlier in the year, I just want to get your uh, kind of just quick raw thoughts on things you're most excited about going into, you know, as we're into this new year, uh, we talked about challenges, we talked about a lot of stuff today, but just like breaking away from that, is there anything from an industry perspective as a whole that you're most looking forward to, or it could be more drilled down to the kind of the world that you focus on on a daily basis, but just, just out of curiosity, anything that comes to mind? I mean, we are seeing a ton of traction in this space. Um, companies coming to us saying like, Hey, customers are demanding this and demanding that. So uh, what I'm excited about is kind of the, I don't know what the best way to say it is the mainstream ex acceptance of this kind of solution. It's a really okay. kind of rewarding thing. I mean, two years ago, the word S bomb wasn't exactly the most well-known uh, piece of nomenclature. And now that's like all anyone talks about for better or worse. Right. Um, and so, you know, that's, what's really exciting to me is like to see the momentum that is picking up around this problem is just like, you know, it's funny when people say to me things like, wow, you like really timed this well. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I sure did. Um, like, like <laughs> I, I wish I could say I had that Take credit for it. Right. You took credit for it. Yeah. Right. Exactly. That's how it goes, man. You, you yeah. always gotta, you know, the harder you work, the luckier you get. So I just you're putting keep... yourself in the yeah. You're putting yourself in the position, you know, from your back, your experience and background, and then you know, finding an opportunity to 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 start a company to solve a particular problem, and that particular problem continuing to to get bigger and being something that really needs focus and attention is, you know, is is what you were putting yourself in the position, hopefully, to capitalize on, assuming that your thoughts on that were right, and if you know, and it seems like that there's a lot of need for this. So that's um, it's but you're right. It's it's harder you work, the luckier you get. So um. It, but yeah. I, I don't think it's all luck. <laughs> no, no. There's a little bit of other other stuff yeah, in there. For sure. Well, Tom, thank you so much, man, for taking the time. Um, we've had, I think, maybe one or two guests in the past have talked about firmware, but to you know, to the level that you've been able to dive into it today, and I, I know the work your company's doing is, is is really much needed and very fantastic stuff. So um, I really you know push all of our audience members to check out what you have going on, um, and hopefully we can do more do more stuff together, and definitely have you back to talk about further topics throughout the year. Happy to, man. Thanks a lot for the kind words, and I appreciate you having me on. Sounds good. We'll talk soon. All right. Bye-bye. All right, everyone. Thanks again for watching that episode of the IT for All podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, please click the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel, and be sure to hit the bell notification so you get the latest episodes as soon as they become available. Other than that, thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time.